This video is brought to you by my Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much for your support. For the past 16 or so years, I've been obsessed with YouTube. I first got on the site about two years after it launched, and even when I wasn't trying to make my own videos, there have been years when I just watched. While growing up on the internet, YouTube culture was probably the biggest constant in the background of my life, but it's changed a lot since then. What was once popular on YouTube wouldn't work as well today, and at a time when being an internet celebrity was a relatively new concept. There wasn't yet a whole influencer industry dictating the market. Early YouTube might be a distant memory, but the first few years of the site set a template for internet culture that's still felt to this day. And when thinking about early YouTube stars, it's hard not to think about a particular musician, someone who captured the hearts of millions worldwide with mesmerizing music and created a blossoming career at a time when internet success didn't always mean financial security. But it wouldn't last forever, and he was just one video away from everything changing. A WA YouTube star is under fire over a homophobic rant. Unlike in other states, he can't be charged under anti-vilification laws. I'll never forget being in middle school, huddled around a classroom computer, while my friend showed me Alice, a remix of the Disney film Alice in Wonderland. Since it was uploaded in July of 2007, it's gotten over 31 million views. That might not seem like a lot in the current era of internet fame, but even reaching a million views in 2007 was a huge deal. Alice was an unusual viral success. Its simple title didn't tell you much, and when you clicked on it, you were greeted with an odd, entrancing song built around samples from the movie. Taking some samples from the Very Good Advice scene, the Australian producer Pogo, also known as Nick Burka, clearly had an incredible ear for sampling. How would you describe your style of music and your style of content to somebody who isn't familiar with uh, what you do? Okay, well, if you're watching a film like, let's say, Pulp Fiction, and you and, and there's the gunshots, and there's the sound of them mixing up the coke on the table, mm -hmm. and then there's a match being lit or a lighter being flipped open, I'll take all of those sounds and I'll sort of turn them into a drum sequence. Like, I'll use them as drums. And then I'll look for notes in the characters' voices, because if you listen to someone speak, and then you go through a recording of them speaking, you'll actually find natural notes in that person's voice and so I would create a, a melody out of let's say Jules's voice um, Samuel L. Jackson's voice I would make melodies out of these characters voices and I did the same thing with Terminator and with Alice in Wonderland and Willy Wonka and all that sort of thing so the idea is to sort of literally put the film on your iPod in the form of a song Though sampling is at the forefront, he also sometimes uses digital instruments and other methods to compose alongside the samples. In his behind-the-scenes video for Aladdin, we can see this in action and how much detail he goes into when processing vocals. I just had the most wonderful time. Time. I'm wonderful time. Wonderful time. This level of care is impressive, and Alice was and still is a remarkable feat, both in YouTube history and just early 2000s music. It's this deeply mesmerizing work where the beat and the electronic elements hold down a foundation while the vocals dance above it. There are enough lyrics that you can make out words every once in a while, but there's enough processing that it's almost complete gibberish. What once told a story now suggests a feeling. It fits that sort of uncanny valley experience where things are just familiar enough to be recognizable, but unusual enough to make it uncomfortable and potentially interesting. This style didn't come out of nowhere. Musicians had been experimenting with sampling and sound collages since the 1940s, and in the 80s and 90s, sampling started taking a serious role in the broader music scene. Pogo's take on that was unique, but there was a precedent. Pogo has said that one of his biggest inspirations was Akufen, a musician known for creating songs out of samples from FM radio broadcasts. And truthfully, Pogo couldn't have picked a more perfect film to sample for Alice. His song very much reflects the surreal, mesmerizing environment of both the Disney film and its source material. And on YouTube, a platform that was growing rapidly with new ideas, showing where some of the samples came from and making the video just as much of a collage as the song was influential. And so it quickly became a viral success. Pogo would keep releasing videos, sampling other movies, and continuing to make beautiful, entrancing tracks. 
And after gaining a lot of notoriety from his Disney remixes, he'd end up being asked by the company to promote their films. So he did official remixes for Up and Toy Story. What started out as a tribute became a collaboration. And even though Pogo's music is often associated with early YouTube, it's also recently made a comeback. Poco's tracks have recently made waves on TikTok, but a lot happened during the almost 16 years between uploading Alice and having a resurgence on TikTok. In the 2010s, Poco would get himself into various controversies, culminating in a video reportedly from a 2016 live stream that was later uploaded to a fan channel in 2018. Hey there folks, I thought I'd jump on really quickly and just answer a question that I get all the time. Why did you call your YouTube channel F***itron? as in f it and then Tron. I've always tried to avoid telling people the truth and just kind of give them something a bit more PC, but no, I'm, I'm gonna be totally straight up and down with you guys this time. I came up with Tron because I've always had a very thorough dislike of homosexuals. I've never liked a grown man acting like a 12 year old girl. I've always found that to be quite disgusting. <laughs> and so, uh, I thought to myself, how best can I express to the world that gays are just an abomination? As you might imagine, this was not received well, and a lot of the fan base he had cultivated over the past 10 years vanished overnight. He was branded as a homophobe, and despite putting out an apology video soon thereafter, his reputation never really recovered. And of course, Disney distanced themselves by removing his music from the Lamplight Lounge at Disney California Adventure. Though the Toy Story remixes he made are still on the official Pixar YouTube channel. He also later posted more context, saying that he doesn't hate gay people and that he's bi-curious, and also that both having bipolar disorder and Asperger's affects the way he posts online. But these points are not mentioned in his apology video. Oh dear, oh dear, the controversy I have sparked. Now, I will never forget being driven through San Francisco, which is the gay capital of America, by the gay director of one of Disney's digital marketing companies. And he said to me at the traffic lights, Nick, why is your channel called Factron? I could feel my heart sinking into my stomach and I had to explain to him, you know, Fgatron is an alias I chose as a stupid teenager in 2005 when I was trying to entertain my friends with vlogs. And where we grew up, a fag or a fagot was a variant of uh, a, a dead or a tot or a prick. Sexuality doesn't enter into that term, or at least it didn't when and where I grew up. Tail between legs moment, I'll never forget it. There are There is a culture of people who are the sort of people that demand safe spaces. They demand trigger warnings at universities. They call themselves adults, but they require an environment akin to a creche. And these are people who are all over Twitter. So I can't stand that sort of person. So the way I draw these people out into the open and have done for several years is to write and say things that I know will grind their gears. I've made a video about gays. That particular video recently has been circulating the web. It has been brought to my attention by my good friend Val. I think the fantastic irony here is Val is gay and he's one of my many supporters and friends who are gay. Now, the things I said in this video, I think have deserved the reception that the video has had. There is no pinch of salt big enough to be taken with what I have said. It's been very naive behavior on my part. If I'm gonna tuck my tail between my legs and admit anything, it's that these posts and these videos and these things I've made for the sake of being edgy have not contributed to any productive conversation. I like some of the things people like Milo Yiannopoulos say, but I don't like the way he says them. Compared to someone like Jordan Peterson, someone like Stefan Molyneux, someone like Christina Hoff Sommers, someone like uh, Steven Crowder, someone like Ben Shapiro, you know, uh, Joe Rogan. These are people I could only hope to become like one day. You know, apparently I hate gay people. Many of my supporters and friends are gay, but I also want to just say that if you or one of your friends has ended up in a bathtub thinking and thinking until the water gets cold, contemplating side because of something I've said in a blog or a video, I'm deeply sorry for that. I think it's possible to take his apology at face value. Maybe his video is satire, and even if I think it's tasteless, maybe everybody who actually knows him is aware that he's not serious about it. I think it's also easy to get caught up in a subjective moral discussion about what makes someone a homophobe, and I'm not really interested in that. And as for the added context he gave, I'm not interested in speculating about why he said what he said, because he's the only one who can really know that. 
In this situation, I'd rather look at what he has said and what I think that represents within the context of his work. So to truly understand his original video and his apology, we have to go back because there's a lot that we haven't yet talked about. Pogo's original work wasn't really political. He found success uploading his videos and that was it. But you could say that the tone started to shift on his second channel, where he'd upload more vlogs and videos that showed him expressing more political perspectives. One of his first big controversies was about a blog post that he later turned into a video that was a starkly anti-feminist rant. After he got a lot of backlash, he claimed that the video was a social experiment and that he was just trying to mash together a lot of viewpoints and pass it off as his genuine opinion. I recently conducted somewhat of an experiment for myself that went with a much bigger bang than I expected. I'm awestruck by the enormous breed of hyenas out there taking gender equality and feminism hostage and blending it into a social status to validate their feeling that the world owes them everything because of their gender. For someone who claimed it was an experiment just to see how people would react, his response to the criticism seemed just as anti-feminist as what he originally said. To those who aren't super familiar with internet culture from 2015 and 2016, the excuses about experiments and jokes might seem plausible, even if offensive, but I think it's impossible to look at his views without putting them within the context of the time. And the reality was, this was the beginning of what we now know as the alt-right. What originated on certain sites, atheist YouTube channels, men's rights activism, and other types of fringe movements, quickly became a general resistance to social justice. And even though many people associated with the US, it was happening in many other countries as well. Not everybody in this cluster believed everything everyone else did, but there were links between queer phobia, anti-feminism, racism, and anti-Semitism. And perhaps the most crucial part of this was the humor. By hiding behind memes and sarcasm, people were able to covertly spread horrible ideology. So Pepe the Frog was adopted as a symbol of white supremacy, but the same people using it to signal that were also insisting it was a joke outside of their inner circles. And when the social justice movement was often painted to be filled with reactionary sensitive students who didn't know what they were talking about, they were often framed as irrational. And on sites like YouTube, it was very easy to fall into an alt-right rabbit hole. The alt-right was growing and people didn't really even notice it. So by the time mainstream news caught onto what was happening, it was already too late. And when Donald Trump started his presidential campaign, it seemingly fed off of this energy. Alt-right communities latched onto the candidate who was known for dancing around words while also using incredibly divisive and direct rhetoric. The idea of saying one thing and tinting out the other was not at all a unique concept in US politics. But I think Trump's rhetoric is impossible to view outside of this type of irony and subtlety that came from the alt-right internet. And in the years since Trump became president, any sense of supposed humor has mostly faded away. Various alt-right movements perpetuating racism, queerphobia, and sexism still have the memes, but they've largely dropped the sarcastic aura that they're joking. And as it turns out, they were being serious the whole time. Now, I'm not bringing this up to say that because Poco was saying anti-feminist things on the internet at this time, that he was part of those political movements, but he did associate with certain relevant figures. He became the face of women. The president of the United States, Barack Obama, was tweeting him saying, you are a hero and a champion to other people who are like you. Why is he a champion? Because he's got tits. <laughs> <laughs> I like Trump. I like the way that he's not afraid to speak his mind. He'd rather discuss issues instead of dance on eggshells around feelings. If you want to talk about the courting game, I think it's still the guy that has to do all the proving. You know, right. how much of a provider are you? What sort of prospects have you got on the horizon? What, you know, the whole culture we have now, like as much as they want to feminize men, I see more and more women in my day-to-day -day life being very manly and being very masculine. And I yeah. don't find that attractive at all. Until they come up with some kind of trans race operation. I'm sure the leftists are working on that. <laughs> You know, you've got all these guys converting to the vagina because they've got their protective status that way. I'm sure someone's working on a way to turn whites into blacks. But the thing is, like, I don't let my gender define me as a person. You see, this is the thing I don't understand about all these tra- Honestly, it's hard for me to believe that he was being purely satirical in his homophobic video or the anti-feminist pieces when it seems like he's completely serious about similar or adjacent views in other situations. Since his apology video in 2018, Pogo has managed to stay out of controversy. He still makes music and he still has a sizable fan base. However, as I've said, his reputation never really recovered from his controversies. Pogo's career represents an interesting time in internet history. 
As an early YouTube celebrity, he experienced a side of the internet that many people did not get to see in 2007. He amassed a huge fan base and made a career for himself in ways that were paving the way for the broader content creator culture that we have today. But his story just makes me sad. Growing up on the internet, I really had faith in what it was becoming. No matter what I was dealing with at school, I could always come home and chat with people from all over the world who had the same interests as me. I learned about queerness, discovered myself, and read so many interesting books, all thanks to the internet. It wasn't just a place to spend my time. It truly seemed like a new frontier. And I guess I still feel like that. But now I don't care as much. And in fact, the time most important to me now is spent offline. The internet used to represent opportunity, but now for me, it represents control. Losing my agency from scrolling past personalized ads that are created from selling my personal data. Spending almost all of my time keeping tabs on queer phobia so I can talk about it in videos. I really do enjoy doing that, but it's also something I need to clock out of every day. The internet used to be a place where I could take comfort in being queer, but now I just see infighting, discourse, and in the worst case scenario, death threats and doxing from queer folks who want me and my friends to not exist. I still have faith in the internet, but now I'm acutely aware of how much faith I put into it. It's been interesting for me to see Pogo's career change over the years. In the past, I've talked about other controversial figures who Disney has worked with, but Pogo is one of the more recent ones who I think also highlights a really interesting time in Disney history. Pogo's music, getting official recognition, definitely was an early example of Disney collaborating with an influencer, for lack of a better word. And it's interesting to think about that when nowadays it's such a typical thing. But Pogo's story just makes me sad. While making this video, I revisited a lot of his work, and I was amazed. He really does have an incredible ear for production. And Alice is just as entrancing to me today as it was almost 16 years ago. But with that comes the crushing realization of how complicated art can be. How someone who makes beautiful things can promote such horrifying rhetoric. How people who do bad things can make good art. Once I upload this video, I'll go back to not listening to his work. But it was interesting to revisit music from a particular time when I truly felt like anything was possible.